Hey, good morning and welcome to Hope Church KC Online. I'm Jason Davis, the pastor here at Hope Church, and I'm so excited that you joined us today. I'm sure by now you are aware of what's going on in our country and all of the protesting and all of the rioting and the looting. And we just want to pause before we move forward this morning in our service just to pray. Pray for our country, pray for injustice to be reconciled and laws to be changed and racism to be eradicated. And at the same time, we just want to just lift up our policemen and our local communities in prayer and ask God to heal our land. We are suffering right now as a country. And I know that many of you are feeling that pain and we stand with you. We stand with our black brothers and sisters in our communities all around the country for justice and for equality and for God to break down the sinful, evil heart of racism in America. Would you join me this morning as we pray? Lord, I pray you would do a work in people's hearts and lives that racism and injustice and inequality would be eradicated as you, through your love and through your powerful Holy Spirit, use good men and women to start and initiate change in our community. Help us stand up. Help us stand together with our, our black brothers and sisters, arm in arm, and let us shout for change to occur. I pray, God, heal our land, give wisdom to our leaders, and unite our country. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So sit back and relax this morning as we get ready to jump into worship as AJ and the team lead us. I pray that it would encourage you and inspire you this morning. Good morning, Hope Church. We are so glad that you're here with us on this Facebook live stream. We're going to sing to Jesus, and we're going to say that he's the king of our heart, and that he's worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship, and that he never fails us. So sing with me, church. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, cause you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh. the king of my heart be the wind without my sails the anchor in the waves oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins the echo of my days he is my
worship you. I worship you. Sing this out, you are, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yes, it is. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. so grateful for your presence in our life. I thank you for the opportunity we get to sing to a, a God who loves us, a God who never fails us and never leaves us, and a God who is a miracle-working God, and he makes a way when there's no way. God, thank you for that. 
And I pray as Jason preaches his sermon, I just pray that you'd speak through him, speak to our hearts, God. We want to know something new about your goodness and your kindness. And help us to get through the darkest moments in our life. So God, we lean in on your presence this morning. So we love you so much. We pray this for you. Amen. Thanks, AJ and worship team, for leading us this morning in worship together. Just an incredible reminder to be together, even though we're not in each other's, you know, with each other, uh, we're watching online, just to be encouraged with the presence of the Lord as he comes into our own living rooms or wherever we might be, to know that we're not alone, even though it sometimes feels like we are alone, uh, but God is with us and we love you and we are with you and we are working hard on plans to gather again at some point this summer. As many of you know who watched last week, we are without a, a place to regather at now that the North Kansas City School District has closed all the schools. So we are, as a leadership team, working really hard to figure out where we can regather when we are able to. And so we will be communicating those details to you on our social media page, here on our Sunday videos. Uh, and so make sure that you're watching those and you're liking and commenting and sharing those as well. We also want to give you an opportunity to be generous this morning if you're prepared to do that. Uh, you can go on our website at hopechurchkc.com give and you can give online there or you can give any dollar amount by texting it to the number that's on the screen right now. Uh, in this time, uh, you know, the need doesn't end. Uh, even though we're not meeting together, there are still so many people who have needs and the church moves forward and the ministry doesn't stop. And so we thank you for partnering with us and for your generosity. And if you're new with us this morning, we don't want anything from you just to sit back and relax and enjoy uh, what the, the Lord would say to you today. As we kind of transition this morning, in a week from now, we're starting a brand new series that I can't wait to, to launch into called Good Fruit, Bad Fruit. And uh, in, kind of in conjunction with that, we want to encourage you that while we can't gather together in the large group setting, we can still gather together in small group settings, in groups of 10. And so if you would like to join a community group, or maybe you're interested in even opening your home to watch this service together with others on a Sunday morning, you can go to the link on the screen right now and sign up or sign up to, to open your home and lead one. So we want to encourage you to take that step because the series that we're getting ready to walk into starting next Sunday is going to really encourage us and help our life get better. And the best way to live that out is when people who are caring and loving us are able to walk with us through that together. So get in a community group. We really encourage you to do that, especially now in this season where we can't gather together. And so as we transition to our message this morning, I want to introduce our guest speaker today. He's not really a guest. He's, he's our, our one and only uh, Greg Frona. He is one of our elders here at Hope Church. And Greg is such a capable leader. Uh, he is right now the spiritual life director at the North Kansas City Hospital. He's also an elder here at Hope Church. He's served as a pastor before. He's been uh, a communicator for years. And so I really am excited for for Greg to have an opportunity to share with Hope Church this morning what the Lord has put on his heart. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and let the Lord encourage you and help inspire your life with what he would say through Greg today. Enjoy. Well, it is so good to be with you today. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are, in your living room, in your bedroom, walking on a path somewhere. It's just so great for me to be here. I'm so humbled and honored that Jason would ask me to come and share God's word with you. And I suspect that you will get something from the truth that God has for us today. But I also want to recognize those of you who might be checking us out for the very first time. However you found us, maybe someone sent you the link, invited you on Facebook. But so glad that you're watching today as well. And I also want to recognize just what great leadership we have in Jason and Betsy. You know, several years ago, Launching a church wasn't even on their radar screen. And yet, because of their obedience and their faithful commitment to God, they started this great work in the Northland. And even in these difficult times, these uncertain times that we've experienced, never anticipated a pandemic would, would disrupt what we're trying to do for the kingdom. And yet they have followed so obediently and so faithfully. And I'm just grateful for their leadership and trust that the best is really yet to come for us. About 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to stand in Red Square in Moscow, Russia, a historic place where a lot of history had happened. Several years after that, I found myself standing in Tiananmen Square in 
Beijing, China. Several years after that, I found myself in Trafalgar Square in London, England. And several years after that, I was in Times Square in New York City. And as I thought about the opportunity that I have had to travel around the world and be in some very significant historic places, I recognized that I had lost something. I had lost the wonder, I had lost the awe of what these places represented. For all I know, I could have been standing in Liberty Square in Missouri, just eight miles east from where I'm standing right now. I don't know what had happened to the wonder, but there certainly is something different standing next to Hammerhand Coffee on Liberty Square versus standing feet away from where someone had given their life because of an overhanded government. I don't know about you, but have you sensed that there's a loss of wonder? Now, I don't mean just in the last couple of months that we've gone through all these difficulties and, and when we turn on our newsfeed or look at social media, even now what's going on. I'm not talking about just now, but I'm just talking about in the recent past. Have you ever wondered what happened to the wonder? And that's not even a question if you're a church person or not. Wonder is something all, what we all want, we all anticipate, we all desire. In fact, let me read the definition to you of wonder. It says, it's a feeling of surprise mingled with admiration caused by something beautiful, unexpected, unfamiliar, or inexplicable. I think all of us want to have those type of experiences in our life. We all want to be able to experience the wonder. And oh sure, there's been times when we've all experienced that. Maybe it was the time when your child was born and you looked into that newborn's face for the very first time and you were awed at the beauty of that child. Maybe it was when you were standing at the altar and from behind the church and up the aisle came your beautiful bride and your heart began to beat a little bit faster and you were awed by her beauty and you, were, you experienced the wonder of the occasion. Or maybe you found yourself standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon or standing at the, looking up the trunk of a giant redwood tree. Or maybe just several years ago, you stared into the sky and watched the wonder of the eclipse. But why does it seem that wonder is something that's frequently in our past rather than something that we expect to happen today? Do you ever wonder what happened to the wonder? There was a television show back in 1988 when it premiered called The Wonder Years. And it sort of reminded me that oftentimes when we think about wonder, this is something that has happened when we were children because children are always so inspired and they're so easily awed by things around them. But this is how The Wonder Years begins. It's the voice of a 30-something year old looking back at his childhood. And let me read this for you. He says, Growing up happens in a heartbeat. One day you're in diapers, the next day you're gone. But the memories of childhood stay with you for the long haul. I remember a place, a town, a house like a lot of other houses, a yard like a lot of other yards, on a street like a lot of other streets. And the thing is, after all these years, I still look back with wonder. But I want to suggest that wonder is not something that we always have to look back towards. It's something that we can live in. It's something that we can expect. And I think that's the way that God intends for us to live with wonder. And it's one thing to lose the wonder of perhaps a relationship or a newborn baby, because after all, babies grow into teenagers and it's hard to imagine the wonder and the awe. Now, sometimes I'm in awe of what they're doing, but that's a different kind of awe. And maybe the marriage that you're in, when at one moment you saw it where the, your heart was racing, now as your bride walked up the aisle, now it's as if you're on an island of bitterness and loneliness. So things happen and life gets busy and life gets complicated. So sometimes it's easy to miss the wonder. But what happens when we miss the wonder of who God is and what God did in my life and what God is doing in your life? When we miss out on the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we miss out on who God is. Margaret Feinberg, in her book, Wonderstruck, asks this question. What do we do when holy awe is replaced by unholy indifference? 
I like that question and I hate that question. What do we do when this, this moment we had with God, when we first discovered His unconditional love and His grace and His mercy for us, what do we do when that seems like it's just a distant past and we're not expecting anything for God to do right now, currently in our lives? What do we do when that awe turns into unholy indifference? And that's what we're going to wrestle with. Now, let me make sure that we understand this. Discovering the wonder of God is not just about taking time to stop and smell the roses. It's not about waking up every morning determined that we're going to see the glass half full instead of half empty. Experiencing the wonder of God is all about realizing that divine spark that each one of us has inside of us that says that we were made for a purpose Psalm 139 says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Apostle Paul writes that we are God's masterpiece, created for good works, which he designed for us far in advance for us to do. When we understand the wonder, it's about what God is doing in and through us, that somehow that this idea of that, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that as, as part of God's workmanship, we have the capacity and the ability to help usher in that kingdom. That's the awe, and that's the wonder that we use, lose when our connection with God becomes holy indifference. Margaret Feinberg again will say that the faded awe is due to the demands of modern living. And that's true. We get busy. And yet to understand the wonder of God is an element that reveals his glory. You see, when we cooperate with God and we do live on purpose and, and with intentionality for what God wants us to do, it's not about us. Jesus said, let your light shine so that people may see your good works and not glorify us, but glorify our Father who is in heaven. And we experience the wonder when we live with intentionality to find it to find the wonder of God, to be awed once again at what he's doing. Now I know the question could be, well, how do we find that? How do we rediscover that awe? How do we rediscover the wonder? Well, there's a group of people in the Bible that we can learn about that were dealing with the same thing. They were in awe of who God was. They were experiencing his wonder on a regular basis. And then adversity came obstacle came. Life happened and they started to lose that wonder. But God is ready to do something miraculous again in their life. And we're going to look at that story. And I think it's going to be encouraging to you. And I hope it's it's encouraging to you as it was to me. But I want you, you, if you have your Bible in front of you, open up to Joshua chapter three. And it's a story of the Israelites entering into the promised land. Now, just to give a little bit of context here, and it's going to be a familiar story to you. Forty years before this moment was about to occur, God had tapped Moses on the shoulder and said, Moses, I have a plan for you. I want you to free my people from Egypt. And you know the story. The plagues came and there was one after another, after another, after another. And God continued to work wonders in those moments until Pharaoh had released the Israelites And they go through the Red Sea. And Pastor Jason talked about that a few weeks ago, this this opportunity that Moses had to discover who God was in some of his darkest times. And And they get to the Red Sea and they go through the Red Sea. And it's almost as if they had lost all the awe and the wonder that God had done, just not too much previous to that. Because God knew where he was sending them. He had a plan for them, a purpose for them to go into the promised land. And so Moses gets together 12 guys from the tribes of Israel, sends them to the promised land. And if you know the story, they all came back. And two of them experienced the awe. Joshua and Caleb experienced the awe. The other 10, all they could see were obstacles. All they saw were adverse circumstances. But this was a land flowing with milk and honey. This was a land that God had promised them. And only Caleb and Joshua saw it. And as you know, majority won out. And so they didn't enter the promised land as soon as God had intended for them to enter in. They wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And we come to this moment in Joshua when God is ready to put his wonder on display again. 
If you look through some of the Old Testament in, in the stories and the narratives leading up to this moment, the word wonder only goes back to refer to what God had done before. And God is ready to do something great again. So if you have your Bible, Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourself, because the Lord will do wonders among you tomorrow. This is a big moment. This is a moment of expectation. This is probably a moment that the people were waiting for, to see God do something miraculous again. You see, many people who had crossed from over into, through the Red Sea, they didn't get to experience this moment because God was so disappointed that his people complained against him and said that the land that he had provided wasn't going to be good enough, that there was fear surrounding there that moment. He said, most anyone over the, under, over the age of 20 will not enter into the promised land. They all died in the wilderness. So people who are about to experience this moment may have forgotten about that Red Sea moment, but some did not. And so they were anticipating this miraculous moment once again. So God's going to do wonders. And he goes on to say in verse 7, And the Lord spoke to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, so that they will know I will be with you just as I was with Moses. Command the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the edge of the water to stand in the Jordan. And God goes on to give them some more instruction that they're going to defeat all their enemies. So here's, here's the story. God's doing something great. He tells he tells Joshua, get the people ready. We're going down to the Jordan River. We're going to cross into the promised land. Here's what I need you to do. Bring the Ark of the Covenant and go down to the river. And so, verse 12, Now choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. And when the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, come to rest in the Jordan's water, its water will be cut off. Very reminiscent of the, the Red Sea in some ways. And the water flowing up downstream will stand up in mass. So the people broke camp. And the priests carried the ark down to the water, just as Joshua had instructed them. And it says, Now the Jordan overflows its banks throughout the harvest season. But as soon as the priests carrying the ark reached the Jordan, their feet, feet touched the water at its edge, and the water flowing downstream stood still, just as God said it was going to do. There's more instructions that God provides in this moment. The priest carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood firmly on dry ground. We're going to come back to that in a little while. In the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the entire nation had finished crossing the Jordan. And yet God wasn't done yet. He says, choose 12 men. And he probably would have said, choose 12 men or women if he was writing this today. But choose 12 from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, take 12 stones from this place in the middle of the Jordan where the priests are standing, and carry them with you and set them down at the place, at the place where you spend the night. God wanted them to remember what just had occurred. He wanted them to remember the awe and the wonder that they had just experienced. Now, there's a lot of different directions we could go with this story. But as far as helping us to reclaim the wonder, there, there's three points that I want to bring out that the story so clearly displays that are step out, stand firm, and set down. Step out on faith, stand firm on the promise and in the presence of God, and set down stones of remembrance. I think if we begin to orient our lives around these three ideals, these three lessons, I think we'll begin to able to see the wonder, be able to reclaim this awe of what it means to follow a holy God. Step out on faith. You'll remember that when the Red Sea event occurred, that the water was already opened in front of the Israelites. But this time, I think God is testing their faith a little bit because he says, go and when your feet hit the water, then the water will stop. And in Joshua, they're very careful to note that it's at flood stage because it's the harvest season. This was no babbling brook. This was a raging river. 
So you can imagine some of their apprehension. I can, I can imagine they said, oh yeah, Joshua, that sounds great. We'll do exactly that. We've been waiting for the promised land. We're tired of eating manna. We'll just get right down to the Jordan as quick as we can. We'll step in, we'll go to the promised land and we will experience the awe and the wonder of God again. It sounded good, I think, until they saw it. And once they saw it, I can imagine some of the fear that they had. Can we really trust God? Can, can we really know that when our, the soles of our feet touch this water, that the water is going to stop? I think that happens a lot to us. When we have an impression and we hear God and we, we think that we need to go and do something in faith because we want to be obedient to His plan and His purpose for our life, it sounds really good till we actually see what it entails. And yet if we want to experience the awe and the wonder, we have to be willing to do whatever it entails. Because wonder is discovered in the unknown outcomes of our faith. We don't know what God is going to do. We just have to take that next step, and we just have to keep following. Now, I don't know what that step would be for you. Maybe for some of you who are watching, you've never experienced the wonder of God because you've never discovered God's unconditional love for you. You've never recognized the grace. You've never accepted his gift of, of perfect love for you. Maybe that's the step of faith that, that God is encouraging you to take today. It's just to say, you know what? I've been trying to do this my, my way my whole life. And I, the results aren't very pretty. If I could have another chance, if I could have a do-over, I would want that. Well, I believe that God has a do-over for you today. That might be the step of faith. You don't have to know all the answers. You'll have more questions than you will answers. But, but maybe today, maybe the reason why you're, you're listening, why you tuned in, why someone sent you to this, to this link to find this service is because you need to have an, have an encounter with God that you've never had before. All you have to simply do is, is ask Him. Ask Him to, to come and be the Lord and leader of your life. Maybe that's the step that you need to take today of faith. But maybe there's some of you, you just graduated from college and you're looking a lot around at the, at the economic climate and you think, oh, I, I don't know that there's a job ready for me right now. I don't know who would be hiring. I'm, I'm prepared, to, God, to do whatever you want me to do. Maybe he's nudging you to put your career on hold and, and go to Paraguay and work with the poor or some other country to work with the poor. Maybe he's asking you to, to start something new. Or maybe you didn't graduate recently from college. Maybe it's been decades since you graduated from college and, and you have some limitations and you think, well, what can I do? What, what, what's, what's important for you? Well, first, let me say this, that God is not interested in the size of our footprint. He's interested in our capacity to obey him and follow him in faith. So it doesn't have to be a world-changing step that you take. It could be something that God is wanting you to do. Maybe it's just to sit down and, and write letters to people who are in prison, to give them some hope, to give them some encouragement. I, I don't know what it would be for you. Maybe for some of you, the step that you need to take of faith is just to commit, you know what? I'm going to love her again. I'm going to love him again. I'm going to give my child another chance. I'm going to risk being vulnerable with my child, to build that relationship again. Again, it doesn't matter how big that footprint is. It doesn't matter, are you going to willingly step out in faith? Because when we do, we'll see God work in ways that we don't even expect. And we can't help then but stand back and be in awe and be in wonder. Intention does not equal action. Faith is action. There were people who were obedient that people stood back and were in awe and wonder of their work. I think of Michelangelo who painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Nobody was impressed. Nobody lined up outside and paid money to go into a place because he showed them a picture on a napkin. It wasn't until he actually put it into practice, until people could see what he had done. Nobody was impressed with Handel's Messiah because he hummed a few bars. It's only when he put the whole thing together and people stand now through parts of that symphony because of the awe and the wonder of what it means. 
And so if we want to experience the awe and wonder of God, we have to step out in faith, take action, commit to boldly doing what he has asked us to do. The second lesson we learned from the Israelites as they began to experience God's awe and wonder is that we need to stand firm on the promises of God and in the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's tangible presence with the people. Now, we don't have that practice right now, but we can look at other places where we see God's tangible presence that, is in, in, that he inhabits the praises of his people. So when we gather together or when you gather with those who are of like faith, you can experience the presence of God. I think admittedly, it's always easier to do things when we know that God is with us. And in fact, early on in, in the book of Exodus, when the Israelites are, are leaving and they're getting fed up with God, Moses cries out to God, God, if you don't go with us, how do they know that you're even at work? And I think sometimes we want to set out and do things on our own, but when we recognize that we have the presence of God with us, then we're going to be able to experience the awe and wonder on a regular basis. But as importantly, I think it's about being able to attach ourselves to hold on to the promises of God. God said he was going to do something. God said to the, to the Israelites that he was going to stop up the Jordan way up the road, not, not just where they could see it. This was about a mile away from where they were going to uh, actually cross the water. So they had to stand on that promise because they probably wouldn't have had enough time to get out of the way if that water broke loose. So they had to stand knowing that God's promises were true, that he could be trusted and some experiences that I've had in my past, I had the opportunity to, to baptize some individuals. And we would gather before that moment and we would, we would pray and we would talk about what baptism meant. And I always reminded them of this verse. I reminded them of the verse when Jesus said that in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And the reason why I wanted them to hear that verse it's not because I wanted to set them up for some time of failure or to expect the worst. I mean, this was a big moment for them. They were going public with their faith through water baptism. And I just wanted them to know that even though they had committed to following their lives to Christ, and even though they were making this great declaration, that things will still happen. Life is still messy. We are still broken individuals. And yet God's promises are true. They can be trusted. So I love to share that with them. And there are so many other great promises. I don't know what anchors you in, in moments of doubt or uncertainty, but the Bible is, is full of great truth. How about God is a refuge and strength and ever-present help in time of trouble? Or, or maybe he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. And then this one that I've, I've leaned on oftentimes is, that these light and momentary afflictions are creating for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. All of us have to be anchored and tethered to, to what God is asking us to do, the purposes God has for us because of his promises. Left alone and left alone to our own devices, we will stray from what God wants us to do. But when we do, then I think we, we fall back into that mode of just having this unholy indifference to what God has created us for this purpose that he has designed in each one of us to do something to advance the kingdom of God and to bring him glory. So we have to step out in faith. We have to stand firm on the promises and in the presence of God. And the last one is that we need to set down stones. I, I love us. I want to just read this uh, again, as to why, why, that, why does God ask them to set down stones? In verse 5 of chapter 4, he says, The reason why I want you to do this is that so that this will be a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean to you? You should tell them, The water of the Jordan was cut off in front of the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. When it crossed the Jordan, the Jordan's water was cut off. Therefore, these stones will always be a memorial to the Israelites. We can certainly forget 
a lot of the things that God has done in our lives, where he has moved on our behalf. A pastor friend of mine named Mark Batterson likes to say, we need to be taught. I'm sorry, we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. Sometimes we want to continue like to teach people and teach people and teach people. But really what it is, if we can just be reminded of where God has worked in our lives, we'll begin to experience the awe and wonder all over again. Recently, I was sitting outside. We just redid our, our porch and actually got some furniture. So we weren't sitting on that uh, bad deck furniture, if you know what I mean. And I was sitting out there in the morning and the sun was just coming up. And I, I began to think about this, the struggle that I've been having with, with parenting. Three teenage boys at home, 21-year-old daughter off uh, to school. And, and just the struggle that I was experiencing. And I, I remember when they, they came into our family, and I, and I use that word intentionally, came into our family because our children are adopted. And I remember the, the, the awe and the wonder that I had that God would actually give us, that he would trust us with his creation. And I sometimes wonder, like, what happened to that? But what I realized is that I was so caught up in, the, in sometimes the challenges of parenting that I started to lose the awe and the wonder. So in this morning, I'm, I'm sitting outside and I'm, I'm thinking about all that God has done. And it was just this, this wave of gratitude came over me once again, this, this wave of wonder and all of the fact that these, these children who were, were fatherless, who were motherless, somehow God saw fit in, 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 in my life, to, in my wife's life, to bring them into our family. It was just an incredible experience. And after that, I, I started to look at my children just a, a little bit different. Now remember, they are teenage boys, so that can be difficult. But I started to look at them with, with a sense of pride. I, I started to look at their, the, the nuances in their personalities and really started to appreciate that. Rather than being a parent who was trying to control outcomes, just be able to say, you know what, God, in faith, you've trusted us. And I've held on to your promises that this, is, this was the design that you had for our family. But I had forgotten. And I think as if I can lay those, those memories down. And I would encourage you to be able to do the same thing. Where has God worked in your life? Because what God has brought you to, he will bring you through. And we have to remember those times that he, what he brought us through. Because really when we go through our lives and lives get difficult and challenging, my, my hunch is that we've all experienced those difficulties before. And when God brought us through, we threw our hands up in praise. We thanked him. We were grateful. We said, God, you did it again. And several years later, or a decade later, when we encounter another circumstance, we panic, we worry. And so God almost wants us to have this, this catalog of wonder that he did in our lives. And so let me encourage you, maybe this week, just sit down and, and write down some of those moments where you knew that it was God at work. It was an only God moment when there was no denying that it wasn't anything you did, it wasn't anything that anybody else did. It was when God came through for you. Because when we have those moments, when we experience that re recollection of what God has done, that's going to allow us to look every day at opportunities to be able to see God doing it again. And it increases our capacity for awe and it increases our capacity for wonder. So we need to, say them with me, step out in faith, stand firm on the promises and in the presence of God, and set down a memorial so we don't forget what God has been doing in our lives. I want to share a story with you, a story of a, two young women, and I'll be specific and say they were white women from the suburbs, who had a God-sized dream to, to start a school. Well, it wasn't really even a school to begin with. It was more of an after-school program. They wanted to do it in the urban core for, for kids who weren't getting the education that they needed. They recognized that the, the schools that these kids were going to wasn't adequate for providing the type of education that they needed to, to really go on to get a career, even to make it into college in some cases. And so they had this desire to start an after-school program, but they didn't start that after-school program because they realized that there were plenty of after-school programs in the city, and yet they were the, the, the fallback, the academic challenges the kids were having were, were still present. And so they said, you know what, we're going to start a school. One of them had a little bit of teaching experience. The other one had no teaching experience. 
two white women from the suburbs in their mid-20s started Urban Christian Academy. It's one of our community partners that Hope Church partners with. But it started with an idea that God had given them. They had no idea what they were doing. They started with a kindergarten class, and every year for the last few years, they've added another grade. They're going to be starting fifth grade this August. And God has shown up in such incredible ways. Oh, it's been difficult. There have been times when I've complimented Kaylee George, who's the executive director. I said, Kaylee, your, your faith is inspiring. And she said, well, I'm just holding on to the promises of God because I don't know how much faith I've got left. And yet continually, month after month and year after year, God has shown up in a powerful way in that school. Donations have come in from different parts of the country. Don't even know how they heard about Urban Christian Academy. And God is still doing remarkable work. But probably one of my favorite things is, is when we start to see the awe and wonder of our obedience is there was a little girl who started kindergarten class. Her name was Denia. Now, Denia had some challenges intellectually, and it took her a long time to even move beyond kindergarten and first grade, but she's finally making great strides. And they've invested in her. And they've, they saw the, the worth that Denia had and they helped her and they worked with her. But not only that, they worked with her family. And one of the most beautiful stories to me is when, when Denia's mom came to the school for parent-teacher conferences, and she was beaming with pride because, because her little girl was able to make progress academically. This woman who had never completed high school went back and got her GED and went back and got a job just simply because Denia was making such great progress at school. But it wasn't just the progress, it was the love, it was the compassion that Urban Christian Academy showed to this one student. When Kaylee and Meredith started this school, they had no idea that they would make this kind of impact on a family, let alone a city. And they continue to do that. I think if we were honest, all of us would want a story like that. We'd all want to be able to see the awe and the wonder of God on a regular basis. It, it doesn't come without its challenges. It doesn't come without its obstacles. But God believe that God is ready and willing. He ordained us for a purpose. So imagine what that would look like. If today you made the commitment to say, you know what? I'm going to change the way some things have been. I'm going to re resurrect this unholy indifference that I have towards my Creator, the God who loves me. What would that do for your family? What would that do for your neighborhood? Imagine the difference we would continue to make as a church in the Northlands if all of us together said, I'm, I'm going to live expecting awe and wonder. And the way I'm going to do that is simply follow God by faith. Hold on to his promises and remember what he's done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we long to see your glory. We desire to see what only you can do in our lives. We admit that we have strayed farther than we've wanted to. We've trusted ourselves more than we should have. We've pushed you to the back burner of our lives. But that struggle is all of our struggles. It was the struggle of the Israelites who discounted what you were doing in their lives until you showed up again and did great things, until you showed them your wonder, and you did. They showed up and you showed off. God, we want that in our lives. So I'm praying right now for the person who may have just realized that they've been uh, far from you, that they've not had relationship with you, that you'd begin to do a work in them. I'm praying for those who have been followers of Christ for many years, that you would reawaken something in them where they'd want to see your awe and wonder renewed in their life. Do God what only you can do. Amen. Have a great week.